Hi, welcome to this lesson on dispersion forces. To start out, why is hydrogen bond an absolutely terrible name for an intermolecular force? I would argue that a hydrogen bond is not at all a bond. And in fact, hydrogen bond is a force, so we should not be calling it a bond. And a more appropriate name would be a hydrogen force or a hydrogen bond force, maybe? Even that is a stretch. Okay, today we're gonna talk about dispersion forces. And to start out, you should draw the Lewis structure for each of these elements in their diatomic state. Um, you should note whether they are polar or nonpolar and then label any partial charges. Because these elements are all members of the same group, their Lewis structures are gonna look super similar. So we have fluorine, six lone electrons or three lone pairs and one bonded pair. Um, same is true for chlorine. Both of those are nonpolar. Then we also have bromine and iodine following suit. Um, I have them listed here in order that they appear on the periodic table. So if we look at the total number of electrons across um, these molecules, in fluorine molecule, F bonded to F, we will have a total of 18 electrons and the atomic radius of one single fluorine is just 71 picometers. My brain always wants to say picometers, but everyone tells me that it's picometers, which I don't appreciate, but whatever. Um, chlorine is gonna have a total of 34 electrons, 17 per chlorine. Atomic radius is 99, so pretty big compared to fluorine. Um, and then the number of electrons and the atomic radius increases, of course, going down the group. But in this case, it's across um, the table. But on the periodic table, it's in the same group. When we have nonpolar molecules, they are called nonpolar because they don't have poles. There's no positive side and there's no negative side. So we talk about our electrons being evenly or equally distributed across the molecule because the molecule is symmetrical. If we look at all of the halogens with just their Lewis structures, they have both nonpolar bonds and nonpolar molecules. So if we zoom in on just, let's say, the bromine-bromine bond, those two bromines are sharing equally. But in this case, they're also making an entire molecule. And that molecule is also nonpolar. Um, it sounds kind of silly to say that, but if you think of something like uh, carbon tetrachloride, carbon in the middle surrounded by four chlorines. The carbon chlorine bond itself is going to be polar. All the electrons are going to be drawn towards the chlorine. But if you zoom out and you look at the whole picture, those electrons are being pulled equally in uh, opposing directions. So your chlorine on the top and your chlorine on the bottom are going to be pulling electrons away from the carbon equally. And then same on left and right. They're going to pull away from the carbon equally. So that's a case where you will have a polar bond, but a nonpolar molecule. Where here, they're just both nonpolar. Now we're going to take a look at the uh, radii of these elements. And we're going to look at fluorine and iodine specifically because they are the smallest and the largest of this group we're kind of looking at. Fluorine has two shells of electrons, and they are organized two and then seven, giving us nine in total. But iodine is much bigger, coming in at the fifth period of the periodic table. It has uh, five layers of electrons, two, eight, 18, 18, and then seven, giving us 53 in total. That is just for one of those atoms. Um, so the iodine in total is going to have 106, right? 106 total electrons. It's also important to note that these electrons are not really in distinct rings like we like to think of them. We know that the Bohr model is really great for drawing, but it's not really indicative of what an atom looks like. Instead, we have to remember the wave mechanical or the electron cloud model and recognize that the electrons are in like this weird fluffy cloud of probability. They don't follow a specific predictable orbit. So when we have an iodine that is, you know, floating through space, it may come in contact with the walls of its container, or it could bump into another iodine atom. Um, those electrons that are in that weird fluffy cloud of electron probability are going to warp, and this cloud is going to become misshapen. So iodine likes to have all of its electrons pretty and organized in a spherical shape, and then it kind of gets bumped into, and it's going to turn into this weird amorphous blob. 
there are so many electrons floating around an iodine atom and even more in the iodine molecule. But what happens is that when the cloud warps, we are going to have a temporary distribution of charge that didn't exist before. So in this case, we have um, a bunch of electrons headed over to this section of the atom's electron cloud, and it's going to generate a partially negative charge. This partial negative is short-lived because remember, these electrons are going to be attracted to the nucleus. So if they get bumped away, they're going to find their way back. And then they're going to get bumped away again, and they're going to find their way back. Um, but when they all get bumped kind of in the same direction, that area of the atom or the electron cloud is going to be very negative. And the area in which they have left that's kind of lacking electrons is going to wind up being partially positive. And when this happens, we can still get an intermolecular force of attraction where our iodine molecules, one over here and one over here, they're all warping and they are going to actually like be attracted to each other like little tiny magnets. So here we have two iodines and their clouds have been warped. And clearly we have a negative end on this iodine and a positive end on this iodine. And those are gonna be attracted to each other. And the force of attraction between them is called a dispersion force. Sometimes we'll call it a London dispersion force. Either way, it's um, caused by an electron cloud distortion because the distribution or the dispersion of the electrons has changed temporarily. Dispersion forces are, in by definition, caused by the warping of electron clouds, and they are the primary intermolecular force for nonpolar molecules. All molecules will have dispersion forces. Um, even in something like water that we know has a hydrogen bond, the electron cloud, specifically of the oxygen, can warp when it's around other atoms or molecules. It can get bumped into and it can kind of wiggle a little bit. All compounds, all bonds, all molecules are going to have some type of dispersion force, but dispersion forces are the only force that is in play for nonpolar molecules. And then the question is, if all molecules have dispersion forces, what really differentiates one compound from the next? Well, Going back to iodine, iodine has a heck of a lot of electrons. So when iodine gets bumped into and the cloud warps all crazy, it takes quite some time for the iodine nucleus to reel all those electrons back into place. And they're probably going to get bumped into again before they have the opportunity to kind of get back to where they belong. A smaller atom or a smaller molecule, a lot like fluorine, is going to have its electrons closer to the nucleus. So the nucleus has an easier time kind of reeling them back in. Um, so, and additionally, because there are so few of them, they don't really move around that much. Fluorine has a very good hold on her electrons, so it's there's not a lot of wiggle. Um, so these electrons are going to get pulled back into place very, very quickly. All of a fluorine atom only has nine electrons, and they're only two layers away at most from the nucleus. Iodine, remember, the atom has 53 electrons, but a molecule has 106. So if you have an, an iodine bonded to another iodine, um, you got 106 electrons you're playing with. Over here in the fluorine, you'll only have 18 at most. So um, the number of electrons is going to contribute to the... Um, significance of the dispersion force. So a key point to remember is that the more electrons a molecule has, the greater and more significant the dispersion force is going to be and how significant that temporary partial charge will be on the molecule. Nearly every intermolecular force test that I have ever read <laughs> indicates the halogens as the perfect example of nonpolar molecules and dispersion forces. And the reason is because they are nonpolar molecules with nonpolar bonds. And we'll get more into this a little bit when we talk about the effects of intermolecular forces, but the halogens are going to be a key group to focus on when it comes to those dispersion forces. I am sure that you have played with magnets, either like scientifically or just for fun. You know that there are some magnets that are stronger than others. Um, 
So if we imagine an intermolecular force kind of like a magnet, the temporary partial charges are the weakest of all intermolecular forces. That's because those partial charges on the molecules that attract one to the next, they're temporary. They jiggle around. One area is positive in one second, and then it's negative the next. So this is a very, very, very weak type of intermolecular force. And that's it. That's the three types of intermolecular forces. In this video, we did dispersion forces. In my last video, we did hydrogen bonding and dipole-dipole forces. So if you missed that, be sure to go back and check it out. Leave any questions you have in the comment section below the video, of course. Uh, please make sure to subscribe so you don't miss the next lesson, and I'll see you there. Bye.